Are you an author who's tired of the long waits and low royalties? Exact Rush is here to change the game. We specialize in publishing with precision, and we get your book to market in just three to six months, not years. But we're not just about books. We also support your photography, web design, and content creation needs. Our focus ranges from spirituality to pop culture. And we're excited about our diverse lineup of upcoming releases. So if you're ready to keep more of your hard-earned money and get published faster, Exact Rush is your ticket. Visit ExactRush.com and turn your creative dream into a profitable reality today. Tap into your most original thinking, organize your ideas, and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Welcome back, friends, to our podcast, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, where we're traveling around the world talking to creative practitioners about how they get inspired and how they organize ideas, and most of all, how we gain the confidence and the connections to get our work out into the world, and that's what's key. We're going to learn a lot today from our guest, the legendary movie producer, Larry Kasanoff who's also the Chief Executive Officer of the Threshold Entertainment Group. Larry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mark. I'm glad to be here. It's going to be a fun conversation. And Listeners, if you don't know Larry as a household name, you've certainly seen him and his company on the credits of some of your favorite movies, ranging from Platoon and Terminator 2 and Mortal Kombat to True Lies, Dirty Dancing, even the Lego Star Wars movie. It's quite a range, Larry. How is your creative fingerprint different in some of these projects, whether they're drama and war movies, all the way to lighter and comedy and animation. I, I've been both a producer and a studio head, and the, the the jobs are very similar, but a little bit different. As a studio head, you tend to be working on more projects at once and a little further removed from the day-to-day in some cases. And as a producer, it's you're more in the trenches. But in reality, I think the job is to be the strength wherever there's a weakness. You got to do whatever there is, whatever it takes. When we were doing Platoon, I was very new to the business and I was the studio and the guy who was the producer said, you know what I do? I, I make sure everyone has a good lunch in the jungle because they shot in the Philippines. <laughs> and you know, Whatever it takes that to make, to get your vision of that movie. In my mind, I always see the movie and whatever I can do to help get that vision, whether it's making lunch or, or doing something much more involved, that's what I do. Yes. And your new book, Larry, A Touch of the Madness, just released from Ben Bella Books. It's a fantastic collection of stories of some of these adventures that you've had and, and creative uh, roller coaster ride. Maybe you can even touch upon the origin of the title of that book, and I, which, by the way, I also love the subhead, How to Be More Innovative and Work in Life by Being a Little Crazy. Exactly. I, I espouse madness. Well, here's how it started. So I wanted to be a movie producer since I was a little kid. And I got very lucky out of grad school. I got a job as head of production and acquisitions for an emerging independent video company called Vestron. And in those days, the mid 80s, Vestron was riding on the boom of home video and home video then was much like streaming now. All of a sudden there were video stores where there hadn't been before and they had room for eight or 10,000 movies. They didn't have any and they needed products. So companies like Vestron sprung up to supply them much as what happened with streaming. So my job out of school was to deliver 80 movies a year to the company, eight zero, make them, buy them, co-produce them. We don't care if you don't lose money, you're in big trouble. And so mostly we made rom-coms and uh, action, high concept action movies with sort of B-level stars in them and horror movies and things like that. And then I got a script for Platoon. And Platoon was a very different movie. It was not a, a, a high concept rom-com. It was about the Vietnam War. And it had a very interesting perspective of the Vietnam War from the point of view of the impact it psychologically had on the kids who were in it. And my boss said, this isn't the kind of movie we make. The people who were in it became stars, but they weren't stars. The director, we had financed one of his prior movies, which I thought was great, but it didn't do a lot of business. This was just was not what we were doing. But I said, it's just something great about it. I want to do it. And my boss, to his great credit, said, look, you're the head of production. So if it's your call. If you want to do it, go ahead. But there's always a but. If it fails, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Choose. And so I thought, I didn't get into the movie business to play it safe. So I greenlit Platoon. When the movie, when I saw the movie, when they showed it to me, it was actually one morning early at a film festival in Italy. I'm the only guy to giggle his way through the first screening of Platoon, not because it was bad, 
the opposite. It was so good. I was like, oh my God, I'm not getting fired. I'm going to be okay. And in fact, it was so good. It won Best Picture that year, the Academy Awards. So I ran into the director, Oliver, a few months later at a bar one night in New York, and he bought me a drink. And he said, kid, I always liked you. You have a touch of the madness. And I thought, a touch of the madness? Is he calling me crazy? Am I a little bit crazy? And then I thought, my boss was crazy to let a 25-year-old kid run an 80-picture film slate. Oliver was, had a touch of the madness by insisting on doing a Vietnam movie in a way no one ever had. And I had a touch of the madness by betting the, the best job you could imagine mm -hmm. out of school on it. And then it hit me. The way to creativity, the way to do all these things is to embrace that touch of the madness. So that became my touchstone for the rest of my career and still is. And it's important when it talks about your show, about creativity and innovation. Why is this important? Because in business and in life, if you want to excel, you have to swim against the current of the river of life, which will always pull you towards the middle. And the best tool you have to swim against it is creativity and innovation. And the best way you have to foster your creativity and innovation is to give in to your touch of the madness. In other words, that, that little voice in the back of your mind saying, can I do this? No, I don't know. My parents, my spouse, my kids, they won't hate me. I can't do it. It's too crazy. That's the one. Do it. And I wrote the book because I noticed in the last few years, not just in my business, but in every business, people are much more trepidatious about being their true, unfettered, uninhibited creative selves. And I have one purpose in writing this book and doing podcasts like this, which is to try to encourage people to be their most innovative selves. It is very encouraging. And you talked about bringing the vision of the idea to life. And I do, did want to focus a little bit on the essence of this idea. And the, we see these famous scenes in movies and TV shows all the time where we're pitching the idea to the producers or to the studio. But how do you communicate the essence of the idea in order to produce the vision? I think so. That comes from, I. it says, okay, I have just easy, have a touch of the madness and be creative. How do you right. do it? There's three aspects. I like cap, I like cap. Create, ask, play. And under create, the first thing you have to do when you have your idea is understand you the essence of your idea. What are you really doing here? So if you're marketing Coca-Cola, what are you really selling? It's not sugared water. It's you're selling a feeling or emotion or whatever, however they sell. And so in a movie, in my example, I think you have to understand the essence of your idea. So when I started Mortal Kombat, no one had ever made a hit movie from a video game. And everyone told me I was crazy, common theme, and I was going to lose my career. But I never thought I was making a movie from a video game. I thought I was making a movie from the story, the essence that video game was based on. And that essence, in my mind, is empowerment. And here's why. The Mortal Kombat started as a hit arcade game. In those days, there were places you went to, if people don't know what an arcade is, where yes. you put coins. <laughs> there was a play. quarter, you put it in. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so I'm walking around thinking, do I blow up my life and, and try all this and take a risk? And I'm wandering around an arcade in, in LA, and a little, an 11 year old kid slaps a quarter down on the machine, and he looks up at me and he says, I challenge you to Mortal Kombat. And then the kid, beat the hell out of me. He just totally decimated me. And if Mortal Kombat, when you win, it makes you feel very good. Sub-Zero wins, you lose. <laughs> the kid felt so empowered that he could control and beat in this game, this adult, he skipped away. And I thought, that's it, I'm doing it. So the essence of Mortal Kombat to me, the essence is empowerment. And it's important that whatever idea you have, whether you're opening an ice cream store or a coffee shop, is the essence of a coffee shop coffee? Or is it a place to go and gather and be around people, whatever. You have to understand the essence of your idea. Very good. And I love this A in cap. Yes. And you've got a great chapter in the book where even, you know, I believe it was two of the first investors got arrested. The third finally <laughs> <laughs> invested. Yeah. I mean, you got to keep asking. I guess that's the message. Keep asking. You got to ask anybody, anything, always, constantly for whatever you want, no matter who they are, anywhere in the world, call them up. So I would ask your listeners this question. If you could call anybody right now who's alive in the world in real life and ask them a question, who would you call and what would you ask? Mm, so strong. Most people, most people say, wow, that's a good question. And they don't know. And the reason they don't know is because it doesn't occur to them that they can do it. But I'm telling you, you can do it. Just mm. try it. This is the best way to get into a touch of the madness, to get into the, the world of it. If Cause maybe we're trying to get the Pope to do something on a movie, the Pope in Italy. We get these lovely past letters, but we still try. So maybe you don't have to start with the Pope. Maybe you could start smaller. But but call, maybe it's your brother-in-law you always wanted to ask a question to, or maybe it's the nice lady down at the library. Just call. 
Call mm-hmm. anybody. And now it's so easy. When I started doing this in college, you actually had to call people. Now you can text them, you can DM them, you can, there's so many ways to get to someone. Try it. Yeah. Do these other channels help with the fearlessness or overcoming the trepidation? Like there are a hundred yeah, ways I, to I, reach somebody. I, I, yeah, I do, because I think it's easier. And I think once you get into it, and let's say you text someone and they don't answer you. Okay, the sky didn't fall in. And let's say you do it again and they don't answer you. And the third time someone answers you and you're like, hey, wow. Yeah, so it's like a muscle. It's If you have never lifted weights, when you go to the gym, you don't start with 200 pounds. You mm-hmm. start with 10. Yeah, so it does because it gets you into it. And then it becomes fun. Because then you realize, and that's one of the ways I know, if I don't mind calling anybody to, for one of my projects, I love that project. And I better be ready to call. A movie can take one year or 10 years to get made. So you better talking about it. And that's one of the ways I know I like talking about it. If I say, I'm going to call this guy and I can't wait to tell him about it, then it's fun. Mm-hmm. And then I know I'm the right try. But yeah, it yes. does help. And you, you just got to jump in. You can't think about it. Everyone's so worried about being judged. So what? What's going to happen? There is a what's the worst thing that could happen moment, isn't there? What's the worst thing? Exactly. So yes. someone does. Most and, people, and Larry, it's great that some of these wins always make great books. But certainly every project you've ever worked on didn't work uh, perfectly, uh, wasn't adopted at the uh, first handshake. What, what were some of the obstacles, especially on some of these that maybe were a little harder? Or I'll, I'll say failed, but maybe didn't reach their full potential. Uh, how did you process those now and come back on the other side. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because in these podcasts, you think, oh, every movie worked, it's been great. Yeah, I made Dirty Dancing, and then and then we walked up and got the Oscar uh, for some other yeah, movie. It and then, it all life. sounds great. <laughs> that's like saying, oh, football game, it's easy. So I got hit yeah. by 700, I'm, I'm fine. So I, I think you have to play like a game. You have to think to yourself, what if I'm an NFL quarterback? And so, okay, we... We lost last Sunday. Maybe we lost because the ref had a bad call or because our defense was down or because they were so good or because someone got a cold. It doesn't matter. You lo- what can you learn? If you can learn anything, take the lesson. And next Sunday is a new game and it's a new world and you just got to go for it. The other thing you have to do to keep the sports analogies is imagine you're a pro boxer and you win all the time. You still get hit 50 times in each round, even though you're winning. You still got to get used to the fact that even though you're winning, you you take those and they don't all win. But you just got to realize that's part of the game. No one bats a thousand in baseball. If you bat over 300, that means you miss seven out of 10. Mm -hmm. You're a superstar. So you have to think like that. You just have to say, and if you can learn something, learn it. And sometimes I have a little trouble letting go. I'm very tenacious. So sometimes I probably should let go a little sooner than I should. <laughs> but yet they don't all win. And it's, sometimes it's misleading in these books and conversations for the audience to assume, sure, all your stuff worked, but that's not true at all. Yes. And by well, the way, it's so tough. It, it's not like people say to me, oh, you've had some great movies. Sure, we'll do whatever you want. <laughs> I wish. Right. But it's <laughs> doesn't, doesn't come that easy, huh? I think about the advice to stay in your lane, stay focused, stay in uh, in your hedgehog, you know, what you're good at. But you've taken forays into technology and video games and even music. You've got uh, a wall full of gold and platinum records. How how do you find that you translate the essence of your creativity into some, some of these other creative channels? That's what I think is interesting about what I what we do now, because in the um, entertainment business, it, it's no longer just a movie. In other words, the pie is getting bigger, but the slices are getting smaller. So if you take Mortal Kombat, it's a movie and video games and animation and live tours and music and TV series and on. And that's very interesting. And so it's always the same essence. It's just a little different as to how you translate it based on the medium. And that I find a very challenging, challenging thing, but it's always keeping clear that that vision of that essence and where you're sailing to. And I think it's very important and fun that you have all these other options for translating things. Because when you said a second earlier, you know, you're always told to stay in your lane. Why? Don't stay in your lane. Drive in the other guy's lane. What is your, that little voice telling you and you're scared to do it? Do it. Nothing great happens without taking a chance. On this book, we made a music video for the book. If you Google a touch of the madness music video, you can find it. Why? Because we thought it'd be fun and it's working well now. And no one as we could find ever made a music video for a book. So we thought, what the hell? Let's try. And so you just got to take, you got to keep taking shots. Love that. 
I couldn't help but uh, take on the challenge, Larry, of who would I call? I've given some thought to that, and uh, I'll uh, put that in the show notes later. But I'm curious as far as what what's your next play? Where are you reaching out uh, beyond you know, just what we're talking about here? Where's your stretch uh, to go to the next creative level? <laughs> I just wrote my first book. Yes. <laughs> um, I actually have a book of photography coming, which you haven't announced yet, coming out in the spring. So I have a second book and called uh, Malibu Blonde, which all the proceeds go to um, of that book. All the proceeds go to charity where I'm involved in a lot of projects now. One, especially it's going to sound a little, little cagey, but I can't talk about it because we haven't announced it. But it's it's just a really wild project. It takes place all over the world. And the premise of the project is also something that translates into real life people start thinking i'm crazy on that one but then eventually i'm convincing them because it's really fascinating we i keep trying i keep thinking to myself when when am i going to get to the point where maybe i don't take so many risks but i take tons of risks every day i still do it i'm not a kid anymore but i still do it and i still can't resist i love that one uh, project that I did read about in a post recently was an animated feature film, X Factor in the Jungle, uh, in collaboration with Simon Cowell. Uh, that's going to be a fascinating one. So that's an animated movie where jungle animals find a discarded karaoke machine and use it to start their own version of the X Factor, where for the first time, jungle disputes will be solved not by violence, but by music. And it's a big, huge, fun blast of a movie. Yes, we're doing it in partnership with Simon, who's been great. Kirk Wise, who directed Beauty and the Beast, is directing it. And we're starting it. So it's a big, huge, fun karaoke party movie, X Factor in the Jungle. I love that. And just putting a pause button and underscoring the essence of the idea in one sentence, you gave it to us. Yeah, the problems yep. of the uh, yeah, confrontations of the jungle are solved with the same singing and uh, not the oh, that's fighting. The of, that's exactly <laughs> it. And it's hopefully that, like you are, that's supposed to make you smile. That's it. Fun, in my opinion, is wildly underrated these days. One mm-hmm. of the things I think you have to do in, in your work life, in your personal life, is, is play all these things like a game. When was the last time you took your staff out for ice cream or bowling or the, going to the zoo? It, it's You got to play it and have fun. It's not enough fun. So a lot of the movies and things we're pursuing, and hopefully even this book, are fun. We want people to have fun. I think the world needs more fun, and and I think it's really important and really undervalued. So The X Factor in the Jungle, I gave you the idea, but it's also really fun. That's fantastic. And what about uh, some of the other aspects of creativity that you touched on, uh, including like mindfulness? I I think the idea of staying focused, but also, hey, while you're having this raucous fun, there is a moment to quiet the mind a little bit and let that creativity soak in. What's been your experience with that? So a long time ago, I read a book by Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh, who introduced mindfulness to the West, a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. And I love the book. And I thought, wow, what can I get to meet this guy again, call people. And I thought, Hey, maybe I can just peaceful Buddhist monk. Maybe he can be inspiration for a character in Mortal Kombat, which is already incongruous because Mortal Kombat is not peaceful. And I went to meet him and after two hours, I felt like I'd been on vacation. So I said, what's your secret? And he said, no secret, practice. And I said, practice, you mean I could learn to be like this? I have a lot of energy. And I became friends with him and some of the nun, the, his monks and nuns. And I, and no, he did not obviously wind up being involved in Mortal Kombat, but I wound up making a documentary called Mindfulness Be Happy Now, which is on Amazon, which is based on his thoughts and mindfulness. It has people like Deepak Chopra in it, and it's wonderful. And it became a lifelong practice. And yes, what I realized is if you're simply in the present moment, you will be more creative because the amount of your brain that is taken up when you're not in the present moment, oh, I got to call my accountant next. What about this? I didn't shovel the walk this morning. That's not helping your creativity. So mindfulness allows you to simply be more creative. And it's and again, it's fun. If you're working on a project with someone, I write a lot of our scripts with a partner. If I'm if I and when I when we do that, that's all I focus on. But if I were doing that and texting people and doing other things at the same time, I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to be so focused on the writing. Mindfulness, I believe, is just a great tool. And it's and in one sense, it's it's easy, but it's not simple. I'm sorry, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's it, because you have to remember to do it. If you just take a few deep breaths every day, you're already in the way to mindfulness. Yes. Yes, I saw that film. And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has been a great influence in my life. 
And uh, I'm glad we touched on this because of that influence of quieting the mind. We think about the play and the rattle of ideas and the influence and and noise in the world, but uh, it does take a little practice. But it's interesting, his, his incongruous titles, The Art of Power, for example, the book has nothing to do with that kind of power. Just like uh, it wouldn't have much to do with Mortal Kombat, but it is an art and it's in the practice, well, not you, just the reading. Yeah. When I was serious, I once, Ty, we come Tyke and a lot of his monks came to Hollywood and I introduced them to about 50 studio heads and people like that. The hope being that maybe they could infuse some mindfulness into their work. I try and put more mindfulness into my movies now. So it, it does seep in in ways that maybe you don't understand. Even if you look at Mortal Kombat and not that Ty is talking about fighting, but the best way to win a fight is to stay calm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good influence. I'm glad you made those introductions. Maybe it does have some ripple effects out into the business and the world. We yeah, could use, we could whatever, use more mindfulness and peace right now. We we could use and Ty is a great expression: peace in yourself, peace in the world. So if you listen to all the things going on in the world, you think, "Oh, what can I do? I'm powerless against Ukraine, Israel, whatever." You're not, according to Ty. Just find peace in yourself, and if you find peace in yourself, you're going to be nicer to the coffee barista, and the coffee barista will be nicer to his partner and on and you can do something so the more you hear about all this stuff just look for peace in yourself that's what ty would say and i think that's a great philosophy well fantastic i think that's a great punctuation uh, point on our conversation larry can't thank you enough for coming on the show my pleasure i had a good time i hope hope you enjoyed it and listeners i think uh if we say we're going to embrace madness uh for fearless creativity I love the fact that we've touched on the you can do it, why why not, pick up the phone, make the call, send the email, hit the send button, all those things that we're reticent to do. And Larry's really encouraged us that the work is good enough, the ideas have been developed, now let's get them out in the world. And that's what our podcast is all about. So thanks again to Larry Kasanoff for being my guest. His new book is A Touch of the Madness, just released from Ben Bella Books and available wherever you get your books. Listeners, come back again next time. We're going to continue our around the world journeys. We've stopped off in LA, Hollywood, Southern California today. We're going to be going to Abington, UK, Warsaw, Poland. We'll be talking with brand leaders in software engineering and even Reddit. So subscribe now and follow our podcast as we go. And thanks again to Larry Kasnoff. So for now, I'm Mark Stenson, and we'll be unlocking your world of creativity. Bye for now. Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media, creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and ThePeaceRoom.love. We've created a special offer just for listeners of the podcast. You can get the book, A World of Creativity, for a special price of $5.98 for paperback. And the Kindle version is only 99 cents. Go to mark-stinson.com to take advantage of this special offer.